Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the IACAC Virtual College Exploration Program for Illinois students. The session you are going to be hearing is about Division Three Athletics. Um, before we get started, just a few little housekeeping uh, notes. Um, your camera and your microphone are turned off, so the panelists can't see or hear you, but we do encourage you ask questions. So when you want to ask a question, you're going to use the Q&A button and type your questions to the presenters. Um, they will read the questions and answer them for everybody um, at the time during their program that they've, they've, they're going to do that. Um, if you go to the IACAC website, that's IACAC.org, um, you can sign up for remaining sessions. There'll be doing sessions till I think October 22nd, but also every se session that's been done has been recorded. And the recording for this session you're, you're sitting in on tonight will be available in about a week. So if you wanna go through, maybe there were some programs you wanted to sit in, in on and weren't able to, you'll be able to view the recording and get that information. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the panelists. All righty, thank you again. We're gonna get our screen up here and running so we get the presentation um, in front of you and we can start rocking and rolling. But to get things started, we just wanna introduce um, our, my fellow panelists and myself as we're getting started. Um, my name is Amy and I serve as a non-resident admissions counselor for the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. And then I have our other panelists here. We have Clay Van Dyst from St. Norbert's College, Michael Elliott from Luther College, and Mike Pettis from Augustana College. Uh, while there are definitely a unique feature of, of folks in front of you as the panelists goes tonight, um, one of the most unique features is that we were all Division Three student athletes as well, and we're excited that you're joining us tonight for getting recruited. What you need to know about Division Three athletics. Part of knowing and every uh, part of this presentation and knowing everything is really understanding the NCAA Division Three philosophy. So I'm going to ask Mike to advance our slides and talk about the great opportunities within the NCAA and Division Three athletics. Certainly, again, as a reminder throughout this entire presentation, don't hesitate to ask questions. We are here for you. But really starting off strong, um, there are three key aspects to Division Three athletics that we certainly want to hit on. Um, and those are highlighted in, in red in front of you. And this college experience is so important. We, we value it so much as your panelists here in front of you, but you're consistently learning and growing as that core student athlete. That student comes first in your athletic experience and you may be used to this experience already in your high school right now. And so with, within that learning and growing environment, you're gonna have passionate participation and really comprehensive educational experiences alongside of that. We're gonna hit on all three of these different aspects within this entire presentation to really grasp what that philosophy means as Division Three Athletics while sharing some more specific information about our particular colleges as well. But this time I will pass the mic on to Michael as we talk about the differences within NCAA. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. Uh, so uh, with this slide, as we compare the three divisions side by side, uh, you'll notice a few similarities, uh, but also some glaring differences as well. Uh, one of the most obvious differences being the fact that in uh, Division One and Division Two, uh, those institutions are able to uh, offer their student athletes uh, scholarships, athletic scholarships to compete, whereas in Division Three, you, you cannot offer scholar athletic scholarships. But another uh, difference that we wanted to point out uh, was uh, the makeup between each of the divisions in terms of public and private institutions. So in Division I, uh, it's roughly 80% of the schools are public with 20% private. Uh, in Division II, it's, it's fairly uh, even split, 50-50. Uh, in Division III, it's actually reversed. So about 20% of the schools uh, are public schools, like University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, Amy's school. Uh, but then over 80% of those schools are actually private schools as well. So we thought that was worth pointing out. Uh, to go a little deeper into the numbers, I'm going to send it over to my buddy Clay uh, from St. Norbert. Thanks, Michael. So again, kind of reiterating and going off of what he talks about, uh, you know, 80% of those schools are private, 20% public. Like we said, we have a little bit of both in today's presentation. So again, you get a chance during the Q&A to 
kind of talk to us about what that looks like. But a couple of the other big facts we like to talk about is everybody knows the Big Ten. Everybody knows the SEC. Everybody knows and thinks of that when they think of NCAA. But in reality, 40% almost of all NCAA, NCAA athletes are from the Division Three level. So what that means to us, and again, all of us being those Division Three athletes, is you still have that opportunity to play. You still have that opportunity to compete. Uh, and there's a wide variety of schools. We talk about here the enrollment, right? Some of those smaller schools can be as small as 300 people. Uh, some of them are going to be upward to the multi-thousand. So, and everything in between. So that average size is going to be about 2,600 students. So again, it's not going to be the Alabamas. It's not going to be uh, the Wisconsin's, the Minnesotas, but it's going to be a little bit more of that personal feel, that private education or a smaller public school. Uh, and again, there's so many room, so much room for opportunity. There's 44 Division Three voting conferences. So that means that there's Division Three schools all over. I mean, I think all four of us are from varying conferences, even in ourselves. So there's a lot of places to play and find that opportunity to compete. Uh, we have that breaking down there about the difference between men's and women's and how much participation. Again, everyone gets a chance. You look at how many athletes there are, 196,000 athletes at Division Three. Um, and whereas there's a 500,000 overall. So a large percentage of students that are competing collegiately at that varsity level are going to be at the division three level. And one of the things that's nice about that and the D three model is so unique in the sense that there's only 19 weeks of participation. So that means that a lot of students have the opportunity to really live that full college experience that you might not get at a division one level where you're a full ride student and your job is basically um, being on that team, being a part of that sport. At the Division three level, 25% of our students have the chance to still study abroad, something that, again, those D1 athletes aren't going to have the chance to do. Um, almost 50% of the, our students are able to work some sort of a job. 60% of them are going on to grad school. So, again, um, going beyond that undergrad, preparing yourself, education in the classroom to prepare for that postgrad. And almost two thirds of our students are involved in some sort of internship. So again, you're getting that full college experience that athletes, non-athletes alike are going to get, but you're still having the, op the ability and opportunity to compete in sports that you love at a collegiate high level uh, competition. So again, I think that what's unique about that too is how many athletes are on campus. I know Michael hit on it earlier, but you know, on average, about 25% of the students on your campus are going to be athletes. So you're in class with other athletes, people that have that passion, that drive for a sport. And you really get a chance to not have to sacrifice your academics for athletics, but also not have to sacrifice your athletics for academics. And you get that full experience of everything uh, that really encompasses what the D3 model is all about. So again, lots of facts and figures thrown at you, but I think that the key for it is just to know that you get the opportunity to play sports, but also have that full college experience. So I'm gonna pass it on over to Mike now for the next step. All right, thanks Clay. And, and we'll touch a little bit on a number of the things that you've already heard, but what I think a lot of you are trying to figure out is what, what really makes the Division Three experience uh, different, um, both in just systematically, how is it different, but what are the advantages of being a Division Three athlete and student athlete? Um, as was referenced earlier, uh, Division Three schools do not award, award athletic-based scholarships. So the, the financial aid and, and kind of talent-based awards that you're receiving are going to be based on your academic performance in the classroom throughout high school. So understand that at a Division Three school, many of which are some of the most selective institutions in the country, are, are really going to be focusing on your, your role as a student day in and day out in the classroom throughout high school. Um, the vast majority of students who do participate at Division III schools are um, merit worthy, which means that they have demonstrated academic achievement in high school that makes them eligible for those scholarships. And what's even more important is as you're talking with, with your peers and hearing about um, students that are receiving athletic scholarships and oh, so-and-so received a scholarship to play football at school X, Y, or Z, or hockey, or, or wrestling, or softball, understand that the vast, vast majority of, of high school student athletes are not going to receive an athletics-based scholarship. Uh, only about 2% of, of high school athletes are awarded a scholarship to, to compete in college. And it's even within those scholarships, they're often very uh, minimal uh, awards. Um, when students talk about a full ride scholarship and even smaller proportion of students across the country are gonna have their college experience fully funded um, through an athletics-based scholarship. And at a division three school um, with financial aid policies and rules within the NCAA, it's important for us as D3 schools to make sure we're awarding financial aid and scholarships at the same rate we are from student athletes to non-student athletes. 
And so the NCAA does follow that and, and schools like us do have to submit our data to the NC2A each year to make sure that we are being fair and equitable to our student athletes as well as our non-student athletes. And then more about the student experience. Um, student athletes at the Division III level are, are typically some of the most engaged and active and, and busy uh, students that you'll see around the country. Uh, Clay did talk about um, some, some stats earlier about study abroad and internship and being involved on campus and working, but a lot of that has to do with, with, with the community that you're in and the, um, and the weight that, that your sport puts on your time management skills and your ability to be a leader and your ability to be um, disciplined. And student athletes are typically graduating at higher rates than their peers um, at the same school or, or just across the country. They're more engaged with faculty members and still being able to study abroad, do research, do internships, and um, they're, they're volunteering. Most of our teams, and I, I can speak from Augustana's perspective, and, I, and I'm sure this is the same at, at the other schools here, um, most of our teams, or if not all of them, we're going to have some sort of element of leadership and service to the community, both the campus community, but the, the community surrounding the campus. And so volunteerism is really important. And just, again, reiterating that you still have the same opportunities for financial assistance uh, through scholarships, both um, academic based, as we talked about, but also need based scholarships uh, with the FAFSA. And so the free application for federal student aid. And so it's equal opportunity for our student athletes, but they're oftentimes some of our best students on campus too. Um, so now we're gonna transition a little bit into um, introducing our respective institutions, and then we'll, we'll get back into the kind of the communication flow and what you should expect um, from, from coaches. So we'll start with Augustana, since I'm already talking. Um, Augustana is a, um, a private liberal arts college. We're in Rock Island, so about 165 miles west of Chicago, right on the Iowa-Illinois border along the Mississippi River. We have about 2,400 students, um, virtually all undergraduate students in that 18 to 22 year old range living on campus. Our average distance from home for a student is about two hours. So uh, the majority of our students do come from uh, the Chicagoland and, and, and central and, and kind of mid-Illinois. Uh, um, we're really, really proud of the number of academic All-Americans we've produced. And as we talk about the, the student athlete um, dynamic and the experience, um, we're really proud to say that we're number one in the state of Illinois. We're number one in our conference, which is the CCIW, the College Conference of Illinois in Wisconsin. Um, and we're number uh, five in, in Division Three and number 10 overall. So uh, we, we are among the best um, schools in the country at producing academic All-Americans which are gonna be students that are high achieving in the classroom, but also high achieving within their varsity sport. Um, Augustana currently uh, sponsors 28 varsity sports. Uh, we've added three just in the last six months. Um, men's and women's water polo are new varsity sports on our campus, as well as women's wrestling. So um, the athletic perspective is, is very prominent at Augustana. We have about 700 varsity student athletes um, that make up our 2,400 student body. And so know that um, it is a, it's an anchor uh, to the student experience uh, to be a student athlete. Now I'm going to turn it over to Amy to talk about Whitewater. Awesome, thank you. Yes, so all great things at UW-Whitewater. Um, Michael actually mentioned earlier, we are a public institution. So representing our NCAA Division III schools who are public, um, a four-year institution at that, we are classified as a mid-size institution. So. Um, considerably larger than some of the smaller private Division three institutions, but no less meeting students from all walks of life. So having just um, over 12,000 students, you're certainly going to meet all types of students um, and definitely a large majority of those students being student athletes. To touch on our location, we are located in South Central Wisconsin, regionally located to some larger metropolitan areas um, that you may know or have been to, Madison, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, north of Chicago, Rockford, Illinois, places there. Um, we do have various majors within um, many different fields, but popular majors expand education and business, um, but certainly can reach beyond that. In regards to athletics, um, we certainly have created a name for ourselves in regards to success, both in the region and in the country. We are in the Wisconsin Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, and we certainly compete not only within that conference at the top of the conference, but as well as making championship appearance, appearances. Um, last year, making it to the NCAA Division III football championship game, but some Things I like to note is certainly for education, we were recognized by the College of Distinction. You are a student athlete, so I can't hit on that enough. 
being that your dedication inside of the classroom is going to match that time on the playing field. So really focusing on your major, what you're doing in the classroom, everything there. We certainly have, um, you know, all, all Americans, national scholar athletes, chancellor athletes, all Americans, everything of the sort. So we're pre preparing you both for that athletic experience and post PW Whitewater. Some things that I want to note really quickly as far as fall 2020 updates. Um, we are doing a free app through the end of the month. So if you are thinking of applying, certainly do that. And in regards to scholarships, we are not requiring uh, the ACT or SAT for scholarship consideration. But all great things aside, um, we certainly have a large amount of successful student athletes. I will now pass it on to Clay. Awesome, thank you, Amy. Uh, yeah, so at St. Norbert again, kind of similar model uh, as the other two schools, kind of finding ourselves right in the middle on the smaller size class-wise, we're right around 2,100 students. Um, one of the things that's super unique about St. Norbert is, much like Notre Dame, we're 98% residential. So that means when you're on campus, uh, you're living in a variety of housings, including houses, townhouses, apartments, dorms, suites, a little bit of everything, but you get to be part of the St. Norbert community for four years. So uh, right on that waterfront property, you're a part of that campus for four years. We're about six minutes from Lambeau Field, so all you Bears fans, feel free to come up and uh, give me a hard time when Aaron Rodgers takes it to you every Sunday. But uh, jokes aside, I think one of the things that makes St. Norbert so unique is uh, our commitment to the athletics. Obviously, that's why all of you are on this call today. And, you know, for us, we have 23 varsity sports. Uh, we have multiple national championships in men's hockey. Our football team made it to the Sweet 16 two years ago. Our basketball team made it to the national tournament this last year. Our women's cross country team has won multiple consecutive conference championships for that. Um, so we take it very seriously. We compete in the NAWC starting next year. So that's a new conference switch for us. Um, and what that has allowed us to, along with the NCHA for hockey, um, again, we're putting ourselves in opportunities to be successful in and out of the classroom. So for us, we have a four-year guaranteed graduation rate. That's something that's huge for us to be able to sell. And we have the number one graduation rate, even for our student athletes on campus. So you're getting that, again, that whole experience of all the greats of the athletics, along with the academics. We've had over $150 million in renovations, including our brand new fitness center for our athletes with a brand new training room with five full-time athletic trainers. Um, so that 20 plus million dollar upgrade last year is something really nice for the athletes as well. Along with the updated number four cafeteria in the United States. So again, you're fueling your body uh, as an athlete and the only three schools in the entire US that have a nicer cafeteria than us are Virginia Tech, UCLA and UMass Amherst. So uh, it's never as good as mom and dad's cooking, but you hope it's a close second. But for us again, um, you know, we are again academics first, your student athletes, We've had Elite 90 Award winners. We've had Academic All-Americans. We've had Actual All-Americans. We've had um, National Championships. We've had Personal National Champions. So, you know, I think across the board, if you're looking for a place that really thrives athletically and academics, like I said earlier, not having to sacrifice one for the other, but getting that full experience, over 30% of our students on campus are athletes. So again, that unique experience of seeing success from the top down, the president of our college is an alumni of St. Norbert. He was a basketball player at St. Norbert. So that commitment to athletics runs all the way through um, from the top all the way down. And it's something that we take a lot of pride in at St. Norbert. So obviously, if you have any questions, I encourage you to visit snc.edu slash athletics. Uh, and obviously, the free application as well with no test optional right now. So with that being said, I'll pass it on to Michael to talk about Luther. Yep, thanks, Clay. So uh, go pack go, right? Uh, Luther College is, uh, is in Decorah, Iowa. It's up in the northeast corner of Iowa. It's about 15 miles from the Minnesota border, about 30 miles in the Mississippi River. Uh, so, so tucked up there in bluff country, an, absolute, an absolutely beautiful area. It's surrounded by the bluffs, 14 natural waterfalls and springs in a seven mile radius. Uh, a river runs right through campus, right through downtown. So it's a very active outdoors type area that way. Uh, we are a private uh, liberal arts Phi Beta Kappa institution. Uh, Phi Beta Kappa is the oldest, most prestigious honor society that any school can qualify to have on their campus. Only 7% of the schools actually qualify uh, to be Phi Beta Kappa, to have Phi Beta Kappa, and we're one of those schools. So uh, we're an elite liberal arts education. Uh, 2,000 students, all undergrad, over 60 majors, minors, pre-professional programs that we offer. So we offer quite a bit for a school our size. Uh, in, in terms of uh, location as well, uh, we're very drivable. In the, in the four state regions. So we're about uh, two hours from the Twin Cities, about three hours from the city of Milwaukee. 
four and a half, five hours from Chicago and about three hours from Des Moines. So it's very drivable in that sense uh, to get to campus. With sports, we offer 21 varsity sports at Luther. Uh, about a third of our campus is involved in athletics and we're competing uh, year, in, year, year in and year out for conference and national titles. Uh, we're also a charter member of the American Rivers Conference. Uh, it used to be the Iowa Athletic Conference uh, until recently when, when we went ahead and added Nebraska Wesleyan uh, to the conference there. So we created the American Rivers Conference. So uh, we're excited to compete there. And uh, moving back to you all in terms of the recruiting process. Uh, and we're just, we're, what we want to talk about now is, is uh, again, you talk about this communication flow. Uh, and what this slide shows you is really the, the similarities between uh, the coaches identifying prospective student athletes and working with them through the recruiting process but then also the prospective student athletes identifying the schools that they want to uh, look into uh, or interested in and kind of their process uh, as well as they move through the recruiting process. So uh, very similar that way, very similar communication flow. Uh, before I get into I the identification and, and how coaches identify student athletes, I just want to mention uh, that again, this, this flow chart uh, in the short term is going to happen uh, mainly in a virtual environment. Uh, I think we're all pretty, uh, that's all pretty well established now, uh, but regardless, it's, it's going to be no less effective. Again, I think all of us are pretty well versed, both you as student athletes, coaches, us as admissions counselors, we're all, uh, we've been doing this for a while now, so I, I, it will be no less effective in terms of the recruiting process. I just want to assure you of that. And then uh, some of the other, my other colleagues here, they, they touched on it, but we're, uh, all four of us, uh, our, our institutions are offering in-person uh, visits. Uh, I don't believe we're doing, we're not at Luther at least doing the group visits, but we are doing, uh, we're all doing in uh, limited in-person visits. So uh, please check our websites and if uh, you can find a time that works for you, I encourage you to visit all of our beautiful campuses for sure. Uh, but moving up to the identification process, uh, first and I think the most well-known way that college coaches identify their student athletes uh, it is through uh, high school comp the competitions. So the competitions in your high school, the AAU, the club comp competitions as well. Obviously, those are great ways for you to showcase your abilities to college coaches. Uh, the next one, and, and hopefully we have more and more of these uh, as we move through the year, but uh, on-campus camps and clinics. Not only are these great ways to hone your skills and your craft, but then also uh, get, get, get in front of college coaches and, and show off your abilities that way as well. Uh, this next one I think is extremely important, except especially with the times that we're in. And this is uh, high school club, uh, uh, high school and club coach referrals. And what I mean by that is uh, a lot of times college coaches are going to go to these, these club and high school coaches and they're going to ask them about if they have any athletes that are looking to compete at the next level and that would be good fits for their program. Uh, so it's important for you as student athletes to go to your coaches and let them know, yes, I want to compete at the next level, or you want to compete at the next level, uh, that it's okay if college coach comes around for them to give uh, your contact information to them. Uh, and it, so it's important for you to take that necessary step so that, again, this is a great way to get you ultimately in front of these college coaches and, and, and have them reach out. Uh, this is another, this is a shameless plug for us, but admissions counselors uh, use us. We're, we're facilitators, we're here to help you. We all, uh, us four, and, and I'm assuming most other admissions counselors would say this, we work for you. Our institutions pay us, but we work for you to help you through this admissions process. So uh, whether it's virtual high school visits or in-person high school visits, college fairs, in-person, these, these virtual events right here, uh, you know, please use us, let us know that you are interested. I know uh, myself, uh, when I meet a prospective student athlete and they show, they tell me they're interested in competing at the next level, I'm calling, texting, emailing the college coach at Luther College right away and letting them know that, give them the kids information so that they can reach out. So uh, I, I, again, I strongly encourage you to use us as, uh, as a resource. And then lastly, uh, just kind of moving on to the next slide, uh, all of our campuses, all of our websites, this is Augustana's website right here but all of our websites have a, a recruit me tab on not, not only the main webpage, the sport athletics webpage, but also in between, in, uh, excuse me, in each individual sport as well There's a recruit me tab. So just go ahead, go into our website, click recruit me, and then fill out the form, submit it. And then I would also encourage you to follow up with an email as well. 
follow up with the head and or assistant coach of that sport and let them know that you filled up the form, you have a strong interest in competing at the next level, uh, and you wanna learn more about the program. And that shows great initiative on your end, uh, and then also again, uh, gets on the coach's radar and, and so they can reach out to you. Uh, in terms of, uh, I'm gonna switch over to Mike now and he's gonna talk about how those D3 coaches make those contacts. Awesome, all right, thank you, Michael. Uh, we will uh, kind of focus a little bit on kind of the specific methods by which coaches and, and prospective student athletes are communicating with each other. Um, it's important to identify and, and schedule a visit to campus, but what are all the different things kind of in between that and during that uh, that make it possible? Um, different things to think about, recruiting materials. Coaches can send out materials to, to prospective student athletes really at, at any point at the division three level. So um, division three schools, what's important to know is that our recruiting rules will be the same for all sports. Um, division one, um, it does vary sport to sport, uh, and but also division two is the same for each sport. So just know that regardless of playing, um, the college coaches at the Division three level will all be adhering to the same timeline and, and, and same rules and regulations. Um, recruiting materials can be uh, postcards. Um, it can be uh, mailings from obviously the admissions office. Um, obviously other types of contacts would be telephone calls. It's also important to know though that even though there, there's not very many limits on the type and, and frequency of communication, the majority of, of college coaches at the Division three level are not going to begin that active outreach until a student's junior year. Um, most coaches want to, to be able to, to evaluate a, a student athlete's athletic ability, but at the same time, the vast majority of our coaches are going to ask for an unofficial transcript as well from you. And so having those grades you know, through at least the first semester of junior year, maybe the end of junior year, are going to be really important for them to evaluate, okay, you're a good enough athlete for, for the fit of our program, but are you a good enough student? Because, right, we're, we keep talking about the balance of academics and athletics and truly being a student athlete. Um, if a coach has to worry about your ability to stay eligible throughout your, your time on campus, that's not typically something they want to have to worry about. They want you to feel supported and challenged, um, but they want to make sure it's a good academic fit for you as well. So they're typically reaching out to students um, you know, after, after January 1st of, of junior year, because that's when they're actively promoting visits to campus. And you'll see that um, you know, our coaches will make contact with students, maybe through a summer showcase or, or a, our you know, holiday tournament. Uh, but the vast majority of that intentional contact will happen after January 1 of, of junior year. Um, official visits versus unofficial visits. Um, at most Division three schools, uh, there's not a, a whole lot of, of differentiation between the two because oftentimes, uh, a visit to campus will include an, an admissions perspective. Um, and so oftentimes those are all going to be considered, you know, unofficial visits because it's it kind of housed through the admissions office, but an official visit for a student athlete can be one where your, your visit is, is, is paid for. So maybe travel expenses are paid for, uh, meals while you're on campus, obviously you're being lodged on campus as well, you know, if, if the school allows for overnight guests. So it's just important to know that there's a little bit of nuance um, and, and stipulation to, to some of the, the timeline, but for the most part, the vast majority of student athletes are gonna be reached out to, um, you know, at least after their sophomore season, uh, but typically for the most part, more intentionally uh, towards the kind of middle part of their, of their junior year and, and beyond. And then finally, um, you know, we're, we're skipping ahead a little bit here, uh, but uh, because every school will have a different admissions process, each coach will have their own type of admission or kind of recruitment timeline. And depending on the time of year that your sport does compete, um, that, that kind of recruitment calendar will, will be different. But if you get to the point where, hey, you, you've evaluated, you've made that contact, you've visited campus, you've been admitted to the college or university, and you're making that final decision uh, to, to ultimately enroll, and you're making that commitment. Um, a handful of years ago, uh, Division III uh, did uh, create a celebratory signing form. Uh, which this is a non-binding form, which means by, by signing a cel the celebratory form, you are in no way um, you know, financially committing or, or, or obligating yourself to that institution, but it is a way to celebrate the decision that you're making to, to attend and ultimately compete uh, for, that, for that coach and for that program. So this can be a, a form that, that's used after your signing day at the high school or at a community event. Um, it's important to know that, that a coach, uh, you know, neither a coach nor a campus representative can be present uh, for a signing um, ceremony. 
um, nor can you have uh, materials or gear swag that, that's donated specifically for that signing event. So just know that that, that form is available. Typically that's provided by um, either the varsity coach themselves or the sports information director at, at the college university. And they can provide that for you to kind of sign that formal um, celebratory form. Once you've made that commitment uh, to, the, to the college um, through a tuition deposit, enrollment deposit, housing deposit, uh, whatever is required for that particular school. All right, I'm going to turn over to Amy to, to close us out and open it up for questions. Yeah, feel free. I'll invite um, all of you to turn your cameras back on uh, now that we're wrapping it up. But I hope that uh, you all in the audience can tell that um, we're certainly passionate about the topic of Division Three athletics, not only because we believe in what our institutions can provide to students who are wanting to pursue athletics in college, but also because of our passion as former student athletes as well. Um, it certainly goes without saying that we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't believe in this opportunity and, and wanting to chat with you all to have that conversation about continuing your athletic passion as well. Um, finding your institution is certainly um, your advantage to listen to presentations like this. You can hear from very different institutions who have shared passion for a particular topic. Um, and have the, all of their contact information right in front of you. So I definitely encourage either taking a screenshot or a picture of this page and reaching out to us if you have particular questions about our institutions, want more clarifying questions just about being a student athlete. That is why we are here. That is what we do for you. Um, in our various roles as well, we certainly can assist in getting you connected with coaches if there's a particular sport you would like to connect with as well. But um, I'm going to just a reminder again to open, uh, feel free to ask any questions that you may have in that Q&A. Um, we will certainly stay on. It looks like we have 13 more minutes, um, so definitely don't hesitate to ask questions. But does any of you gentlemen have questions right now that you certainly... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring one up that I know that we've had a number of students ask us throughout the, the fall um, when they're visiting campus and with a couple of other of the sessions that we've done here during the fall, students just asking about, you know, what if I didn't have a junior season or what if I wasn't able to play, you know, club uh, ball over the summer or my, my fall season's been moved to the spring and I'm a senior. Um, understand that you're not the only one in, in that position and our coaches and our admissions offices are doing the, the best job that they can uh, to evaluate students fit, but also realize that it's not, again, reiterating, it's not just about the, the athletic fit of you for that program. Of course, our coaches want athletes that can come in, can make an impact. Um, there may be more, a higher need for development uh, for a year or two uh, for, for student athletes here this, this next year, because maybe they, they didn't have a season. But our coaches are looking at all aspects of fit, not only your athletic ability, but, but also the, the, the academic uh, fit as well. Um, and, okay, and then we got a question from Blake um, about, uh, you know, is this the same for different states, like in Missouri? Um, each, each state in, at the Division three level, if that's kind of what you're asking, we'll, we'll have a very comparable um, kind of recruitment calendar, uh, but but also kind of admissions kind of policies. I mean, each each school will have different deadlines and different stipulations for admission to, to that college or that university. But generally, the same process will will, will be applicable, um, kind of regardless of what state you're considering. It looks like we got a second question here. It talks about how much school do you miss as Division three athletes? I think that's a great question. Um, you know, for I, I'm a current coach at the Division Three level, and for us, we always kind of talk about you need to be prepared for a day or two a semester. Um, again, with the college model, you're not in the same class every day, so you might miss one Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. You might miss one Tuesday, Thursday class. Um, but again, a lot of teachers, again, not speaking for every school, but especially for us at St. Norbert, teachers are understanding of a couple misses. And what Division Three schools do a great job of is kind of getting in front of it. So you're going to your teachers a week in advance and saying, hey, I'm missing Friday. What am I going to miss? How's that going to affect it? And again, you are a student athlete first. The school comes first. So uh, the professors do a great job of really making sure you're on top of it. But again, with our conferences, as you saw as we were talking through it, a lot of our conferences are closer areas. So you're not flying from Alabama to Tennessee like you would at Division One, or from Pennsylvania at Penn State to Wisconsin for a Big Ten game. 
So the division three model, a lot of times it's going to be closer travel, closer trips so that you're not having to miss as much academic. So I think that that's obviously one that um, hopefully isn't as much of a concern at the division three level. Oh, I just real quick. I always touch on um, particular personality characteristics that you will learn and um, improve upon when you are a student athlete that go hand in hand with what Clay was just touching on. Um, you're going to learn communication, time management, organization, and these are things that you probably already start to build in high school, but you're going to build so much more when you are in college because it's important for you not only for your athletic success, but most importantly your academic success. And so being able to have those tools in place like office hours for professors and their emails, even study tables when you uh, are a student athlete, so most uh, teams will require study tables for homework time and things like that. Um, those are really strong skills that you will gain as a student that will only continue on in your professional career, which looks great on a resume. <laughs> no. Sorry, Michael. No, that's all right. No, it's, it, both of those are great points. And I, I just wanted to mention too, again, I, I, I wrestled at Luther College. I, I coached college wrestling for two other institutions. Uh, now I obviously work for, for Luther. Uh, I, it, it's, uh, and this isn't the same for everybody in every sport, but it's also a lot of the co sports are actually are required to get their schedules uh, approved by the student government, student senate, uh, the faculty, you know what I'm getting at. So uh, they actually have to get those schedules approved so that they aren't missing a lot of class as well. So there's actually a built-in mechanism there to, to make sure you're not missing too much class. One other question too that I would encourage, uh, not necessarily to ask us, but to ask uh, your coaches, uh, the college coaches, when you do make these visits or you're going through the recruiting process, uh, I always encourage student athletes to ask them about uh, what they have in place for uh, academics with their sport. So if I were going to play hockey up at St. Norbert and I was talking with Clay, I would ask him, what do you have in place in terms of uh, study tables? Uh, what's mandatory? Tutor, uh, what, what kind of tutoring do you have available for, for athletes and things like that? I think those are important questions to ask. Uh, your college coaches, what 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 types of programs do they have in place from the academic side of things? So, so there's another question that popped up here. It talked about um, what's the difference between a preferred walk-on and a scholarship athlete. And I think that's a great question. So um, one of the things I, I always heard from a coach of mine one time was a preferred walk-on at a scholarship school. What that means is that they preferred to give that scholarship to somebody else. Um, so I think a lot of times it's about finding that program that's the right fit for you. As we talked about, you know, 40% of athletes that play NCAA are at the Division three level, and they're still competitive. There's national championships to be won. There's conference championships. There's all Americans. There's success on that team. So, you know, I would encourage you to Find that program that's the right fit for you. Find the coaches that are the right fit for you and find the school that's the right academic fit for you. Because while it may be intriguing to be a preferred walk-on at a big school or something like that, I think that there is something to be said about going to a program that wants you as their first choice, not as their backup to somebody, again, that they prefer to give that scholarship to somebody else. So uh, I think that's a great question. I think that that's something that, again, is a big deal with the Division Three because there are those opportunities at Division One and Division Two. And who knows, while it's a one in a million shot, Duncan Robinson did it and he had a pretty great run. <laughs> All right, um, a question from uh, another one from Blake. So if a student would start a division, division three school, you know, could they, could they go on to a bigger school? Um, you know, of course, um, you know, any, anything is possible and, and everybody's path is, is, is different. Um, I think we've all heard uh, from our respective uh, professions here and admissions that uh, most students are on a winding path rather than a straight line. And we ultimately want you to find the best fit, right? We keep talking about fit academically, socially, financially. Um, I would say uh, for most students, um, the opposite scenario uh, is more likely where they're at a larger school or they miss their sport or they, they tried to, to go as a scholar or you know, a walk-on athlete or a larger program and it just wasn't a good fit. Um, and so they find a better fit at a division three school where maybe they're able to make an immediate impact. Um, and my, my best friend played division one, uh, big 10 college football. And he had the opportunity to, to contribute a little bit um, as a junior and senior, uh, but was not a starter. 
And so you got, it's also the weighing that um, the opportunities, you know, do you want to play for four years? Do you want to contribute for four years, be able to make an impact? Do you want to have the chance to be an all American, a national champion, a conference champion, academic all American, or simply a participant? And, and some students are okay with that, but those are definitely questions that, that you have to answer for yourself. We got another great question in regards to the recruiting process being the same for a walk on or quote, I'll quote unquote this regular division three student athletes. Um, so I can speak firsthand to this question. I was a walk on at UW Whitewater for the women's basketball team. And it certainly didn't change the process for me um, in respect to I, I wanted to still communicate with admissions and with the coaches and do a visit and you know, uh, get them film or, or come and do an official visit. Um, but a lot of that communication was um, started by myself, right? It wasn't necessarily a coach reaching out to me. I was much further than where UW Whitewater is. So it was hard to find me, <laughs> but um, it was certainly one of those where if you got the motivation to reach out to a coach, that recruitment process will be the same um, in getting, doing the application for admission and, and keeping that communication visit, all that will be the same process. So we're, we're there's no matter the division three institution, there's no segregation between, you know, a recruited athlete versus a walk-on athlete. It's really the opportunity and initiative from you as a student athlete. And certainly your parents or support system can be that driving force of communication. The coaches and, and us admissions counselors always like to hear from the students, but uh, it certainly sometimes takes some help if, if you need it, but there's no difference, at least in my experience. <laughs> yeah, and to Amy's point, again, there are no scholarship athletes at Division Three, so every recruit when they come in is kind of seen the same. And, you know, I know Michael hit on it earlier, but reach out to coaches, reach out to admissions counselors. Like Amy was saying, that's the best way to be in contact. Uh, Mike hit on it on the slides that there's no – uh, limit to digital communications for you as recruits. So, you know, definitely if there's a school you're interested in that you think is the right fit for you academically and athletically, I think it's important to reach out. And uh, going back to the last question really quick, it talked about, you know, division three, wanting to go to division one. One of my favorite quotes is make the big time where you are. Uh, so I think, you know, a program, a school, an institution that you choose is going to be as big or as small as you make it. And you have every ability to make the big time and make an impact at wherever you're at. Uh, and I can promise you that winning a national title at Division Three feels just as good as it does at Division One. Mm. Oh, that got me all hyped up. I'm like, Preach. oh man, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Any last minute questions? We've got two more minutes here, so we'll probably transition over to our Strive Scan host, but. Um, certainly feel free to reach out to us if anybody has any more specific questions about our institution or about being an athlete. But thank you all so much for joining us. This was great. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I want to thank our panelists. That was a great presentation. A lot of great points. Um, you, when you log out tonight and close the window, there's going to be a very quick survey question, four questions, won't take you but a, a few minutes to answer. We'd really appreciate you doing that. It helps us make this a better program for everybody. And again, as I mentioned in the beginning, if you go to the IACAC website, that's IACAC.org, you'll be able to sign up um, for more uh, sessions or do the recordings uh, of the previous sessions. So thanks for joining us tonight and everybody have a great evening. <laughs>